Hello, my dear friends uh, of generative art. Would you please come in and uh, we move ahead? Um, next presentation is Michael A. Noll. Frieda Nake already mentioned, he is unfortunately not able to come to Europe any longer from the East Coast, but he wanted to be here saying welcome personally. As this was not possible, he sent us a video contribution about the beginnings. He is one of the three guys uh, that did computer art independently in 1965. Like Frieda Nake, like Georg Nees and Michael A. Noll, he is the third one. And uh, yeah, here is his presentation. Thank you for inviting me to participate in the event, and in particular, thank you to Suzanne Franca for inviting me and for organizing all this, and also to Dr. Margaret Rosen for all her work in making it possible for me to do the presentation. I wish I could be there personally, but my health and old age kind of prevent that kind of a trip. So I put together this slide presentation that covers what it was like at Bell Labs back then when I was doing this work and also specifically talks about what I did. I hope it's not too boring to sit there and listen to it, but thank you. What this was all about is Bell Labs. Here's a photograph, thanks to them, that shows what the facility looked like. This was a huge complex at Murray Hill, New Jersey. A development work went on, research went on, administration, computer center, huge parking lots with a lot of employees and all. And the place was usually busy at all hours because you couldn't keep most of the people away. The work that went on there, which was not the official work, this was work that went on sort of during evenings and weekends and part-time, had to do with computer music. And that was specifically Max Matthews and John Pierce, and also computer animation and graphics. And some of those people, names we know, uh, um, certainly um, Ken Knowlton and the B-Flix package of macros that he wrote to use in Fortran to do animation. The orbiting satellite by Ed Zajac is well known too. And random dot stereograms were being done by Betelitos. So what made that possible? And we also had a lot of interesting visitors coming by too a lot. Um, Leopold Stokowski came by one day to see what we were doing. Um, Nam Jun Paik, the video artist, came to Bell Labs. I tried to teach him programming. I somehow thought it didn't work and that he never learned it. And then thanks to some recent research by Greg Zinman at Georgia Tech, we found out that he did, that Paik actually learned Fortran, learned programming, and did some computer art and some computer animation. And incredible. Laurie Spiegel was doing mostly computer music, but she also did some art, including a very early paint software program in the early 70s. So there was a lot of interesting people coming by. They weren't employees. They were visitors. And we, there was no formal program to bring them in. Some paint just approached Bell Labs and said, can I come maybe and do some computer stuff? And we said, sure. And he came. What was the environment? This was a very open environment to allow this kind of creative work going on. It was probably because communications was broadly defined and we're very much interested in people and how they interacted with the computer, what was back then called man-machine communication. I guess today it had to be called person-machine communication. But what really made it possible was the two people, Bill Baker, who was vice president of research, and John Pierce, who was executive director of the research division that we were all working in. And they championed it and they protected it and allowed it to occur. The owner, AT&T, was not happy with this work back then, but Baker and Pierce defended it and said, who cares about AT&T and what they object to? We have creative people, they need to do creative work. We had the technology. Why didn't this happen more broadly back in the 60s, computer art? Well, because back then, <laughs> big computers were mainframe computers that occupied uh, almost a whole floor of a building with their own air conditioning and everything. We had the IBM 7090 computer and 7094 computers. And we also had significant graphic output, namely in this case, the microfilm plotter, the Stromberg Carlson SC4020, 
which drew images on the face of a cathode ray tube, while a 35 millimeter camera captured each one on a frame. My earliest work was accidental. A colleague had a computer program that went wild and made all sorts of crazy looking images that looked an awful lot like abstract art. And I thought, gee, computer art, can I do it deliberately? And I programmed it and wrote that up in what was called a Bell Labs Technical Memorandum and dated August 28th, 1962. That memorandum is up on the internet if somebody wants to read it. Some of my earliest works were vertical, horizontal, Gaussian, quadratic, I'll get to in a little while and talk about them. And here they are. In the center is Gaussian quadratic. It was sort of, in one direction, it was random numbers calculated by the computer, and the other was a mathematical quadratic equation. We get up to the top and then fold back down again. I had all sorts of different versions of this I experimented with and looked at and liked this particular one that's there. On the left is the vertical horizontal things, program requiring things always go at 90 degrees. Up in the upper right is a takeoff on Bridget Riley's currents. And then it's called 90 parallel sinusoids and all. And if you wiggle the paper, it will ripple and give you op effect. Down the bottom is the famed Mondrian experiment, which we'll talk about in a minute or two. The reason I think I liked Gaussian quadratic was I, I didn't do it with the Picasso on the right in mind, but I think it reminded me because I knew of the cubism and I really liked cubism. And I think the Gaussian quadratic in a way is cubist. It wasn't meant to be, so I just liked it. That was, to me, that was one of the things that made computer art fun. You could program and think you knew what you were doing then things would come out that were a little bit of a surprise, pleasantly as a present, pleasant surprise. In many ways, the artist using oil paint, the way the oils flow together can be a surprise too. I would print it out on paper, the pattern, and then use colored markers and color over the lines and make like a colored version. And then I would give this to some colleague or somebody came in my office and say, I put, I'd sign it maybe and say, here you have your own computer art, and they would hang this up on the walls in their offices and all. It was fun. This was, was Bell Labs. This was in the 60s. I also made a color separation version, red, green, green, and blue type of thing, and for the photography department helped put it together and all. So we were looking at color. Uh, some scholars have said Bell Labs didn't do anything in color back then. No, we were doing things in color, yes, indeed. The next idea that occurred was deliberately use the computer to, to sort of make its version of some painting by a famous artist. And what was suggested was Mondrian, not the block things that he does, but the things that were taken off about piers and water, which culminated with the one on the left and all that he did. And I did a computer version, which is the one on the right. So I wrote an algorithm and we now have these two different versions. And um, since at Bell Labs, when I first went there, I was working in psychology, experimental psychology and human factors. The obvious thing to do is show them the people and see which one they prefer and reproduce them in a way that there were no clues and uh, hundred subjects at Bell Labs. And the majority preferred the computer. They didn't know it was the computer, but when they asked which they thought was the computer and which was the Mondrian, the majority, 72%, were confused and thought the computer was the Mondrian. And this was a famous paper published in the Psychological Record in 1966. It too, you can find on the internet. No. The next idea that occurred to me was, do artists have a special sense of aesthetics? And I said, okay, I can use these random patterns generated by the computer, the Mondrians, a series of them, from something very ordered to something very disordered and see. So I had a subject pool, students at uh, Drew University in New Jersey, and uh, showed these patterns and which one they prefer. All right, some of them had substantial artistic training, others didn't. And the essence was, are there a, any difference meaningfully in the cycle, their, their preferences and all? And the answer was there was not, not, which would opens up the question is, the, is there a special aesthetic that the artist has compared to a non-artist? Um, this was interesting to me because I thought these com computer-generated patterns 
could be used in experimental aesthetics to understand people's preferences. I have no idea what's happened in the, the many years since, the decades since, whether that's happened or not. But that's what I was trying to advocate and get people to do. I had a lot of interest as a child in these stereo viewers, 3D viewers. So the idea of using the computer to generate a pattern for the left eye and one for the right eye, stereographic, and then look at them with some sort of viewer uh, occurred to me. Uh, the idea would be looking at three-dimensional technical scientific data, or perhaps even artistic things, and uh, doing things which were pseudo-random. I saw this possibly as a tool for a sculptor before making some object. You can make a computer version, 3D, look at it from different directions, different angles, things of that variety and all. I also got the idea of looking, again, aesthetic preferences, 3D preferred over 2D, and is random preferred over order. And that was another experiment. These are the stereo pairs. If you were to look at these cross-eyed, they would be indeed in 3D. So we had 3D versions, 2D versions, again, more ordered, like at the bottom, more structured, and more disordered, like the top. The result of this experiment was that the 3D was always preferred over 2D for any one of them. And the more disordered was more preferred over the ordered. 1965, Howard Wise had a wonderful experimental gallery in New York City on West 57th Street, a few doors down from Carnegie Hall on the second floor. And he saw some of the random dot stereograms that Bela Eulas was doing and invited Bela to do, show some of them in an exhibit. And Bela was kind enough to add me in. So we had this show in April 1965 showing Bela's works and my works and things of this variety. And some of them were a lot of the 3D and we had actually 3D glasses there for people to look at. Uh, we had a great debate with Howard on how to share the money. We, if we sold anything, we would extract the cost and then share the profit 50-50. The interesting thing, of course, is not a single thing sold. So all this debate and discussion about who got what was just meaningless. AT&T tried to stop the exhibit when they found out about it. I guess they thought it was too kind of crazy to be the Bell Labs people doing art. But so as a result of that, they said we, I was allowed to copyright or own all my patterns. And the actual Gaussian quadratic pattern work is registered the U.S. Patent Office and copyrighted 1965. Now, that was a great debate because the Copyright Office said, we can't register anything done by a computer. I said, we have, it was programmed by a human and had some mathematical and then some randomness. Oh, the Copyright Office said, can't do anything, can't register anything done that's random. I said, yeah, but the random was just a program that calculated numbers that seemed random to we humans. Then the Copyright Office said, okay, no problem. The announcement for the show was a little small deck of IBM cards, four cards, which were punched out and sent out. And, all, and there on the bottom, you can see the date. And, when, and, and then we had an opening and all. Howard Wise, in his gallery, in the 10 years it operate, was incredible. Um, Nam June Pegg's video art was shown. Jerry Oster's op art was shown. Very innovative, very forward-looking to new media and things. And what's amazing to me, this many years later, is a few blocks away down the street was the Museum of Modern Art that seemed trapped in the past while Howard was looking to the future. There are some photos from the show. Uh, you can see uh, there's a, some of the vertical horizontals in the top right and then uh, and up on the wall. Some of the pictures Howard thought was nice to take a positive and a negative and mount them next to each other. And there are some of my patterns shown like that too. Uh, I don't have no idea who will attend it. Um, I have no idea how many artists attended. I'm trying to, we were all trying to attract the attention of artists to this new potential medium. I do know now many years later, based upon papers that Zinman found, that Paik was at the show, saw it, and that's where he acquired his interest in computers. We have a 35 millimeter film coming out of the computer, why not animate? So 3D animation is what I started doing. Number of different images and all. Uh, computer-generated ballet, hypercubes, and things, and I'll show you now some examples of them.
This is a kinetic sculpture. Again, if you looked at this cross-eyed, it would be in true 3D. We just go zooming along here as it keeps changing its shape. Kinetic sculpture, 3D on the computer. It was done in the before, before you know, around 1964, 65 time frame. Little dancers, stick figures running around on a 3D stage. Again, stereoscopic. And they just run through each other, random motion on the stage. The, the, the arms are being waved, I would claim, by the females trying to attract the attention of the male dancers if you, and all. This was shown to a number of choreographers in New York. Again, but trying to interest them in the idea of maybe programming using a computer interactively with stick figures to actually choreograph and then get a feel for what the actual work might look like on the stage. Hypercube, four-dimensional hypercube, rotating, perspectively projected from 4D to 3D, and then stereographically shown here. Looks like a cube turning inside out and enveloping another cube. Very, very pretty motion. Everybody liked this movement motion. Again, looking at cross-eyed, it would look in three dimensions. Next, I got the idea, of maybe put words in the four-dimensional space and let them rotate and see what's happened. And that ended up being used to do the title sequence for an AT&T documentary called Incredible Machine. The person sitting at the computer is Max Matthews. Judson Rosebush claims that this is probably one of the earliest use of computer animation to do what he called a flying title. Of course, it's the time frame is right, and that's when new ideas occur. It's, it's not one person in one place. It's many people in many places. And here are some of the others, of course, Naka and Nice in Germany, creating what some people call the three N's, Naka, Nice, and Noel. Uh, Leslie Mezai up in Toronto at the university there was doing very innovative things too. Of course, Herbert Franca in Germany too. Chuck Suri at Ohio State, and of course the in Yugoslavia, and later in Israel, Vladimir Vanachik and his New Tendencies movement and all his promotion of new media. Very, very, very innovative people. And of course, in '68, a special show of new media in London, Institute for Contemporary Art, Cybernetic Serendipity, organized by Joshua Reichart. On the left is the catalog she produced for this incredible show. She spent years in advance traveling around the world, gathering material, wrote a wonderful book with wonderful papers, cybernetic art and ideas. She took two of my papers, the one about the digital computer as a creative medium and the, and the drawings and art and, and works from another paper and combined them together into one in that book. And, and, and just incredible woman with incredible vision in terms of what she did. Doing computer art and animation was not my full-time job, which is fun. But I did do other things later on in the later part of the 60s. Worked with Michael King and Walter Berry to do a computer hologram, one of the earliest uses of a computer to actually create a hologram, and we did it of one of my random 3D objects. I went on then to do interactive systems with 3D input device, three-dimensional joystick, stereoscopic displays, then used motors on the input device to give people force feedback and uh, so that you could actually hold on to this 3d joystick and feel as if you're bumping into things and feel around them in essence force feedback um, in many ways what became today's virtual reality and i'm showing on the right there is the patent patent was issued for this very broadly 3d input 3db output force feedback output digital computer that's what was covered here is Peter Denish using the stereoscopic interactive system. You can see the joystick in his hand and the display. Here again is the tactile patent showing on the left the broadness and on the right the actual thing, that, the actual instrument that was designed with 3D up and moving it from left to right and all. Some final thoughts. Art and technology. Art has always used technology, new paints, new media, glass, you know, ceramics, 
it, the, the two have always been locked together. Of course, Leonardo is the best example of all. I thought that the artist using the computer becomes a new breed, a, a new form of art, a new type of artist, computer artist. We've always wondered what is computer art? Is it algorithmic, the, the program and what's there and the programming of it? Or if you're sitting at the computer using somebody's paint program and all, what is the work of art? Is it the algorithm? Is it, is, is it, you know, what, is it an actual art object? Darcy Gerbarg uses computers to generate patterns, which she then has turns into actually oil paint on, on a canvas. So this actual work of art, there's something there. What is a computer artist? If I take a photograph of a oil painting and then do something with it and play around with it, does that make me an oil painter? Of course not. All right. So, so what, what, how do we define these things? It, it makes for interesting events and conferences to talk about these things. Meanwhile, of course, thank you for your attention. I hope you found this interesting. I wish I was there to answer some questions or hang around during the intermissions and meet people and say hello. Thank you indeed.